Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you for joining us today for the latest installment in Smart Bridges Information Management Webinar Series. Uh, today's topic will be about Mobile BI in 2015 and the five important things uh, to know to make it happen for your organization. I am Matt DeBona, a director in Smart Bridges Enterprise Information Management Practice. And uh, I'm Ryan Campanile. I'm a vice president in REIM Practice. So today, uh, I'm going to cover uh, several of these agenda topics, and Ryan will cover uh, the, the final two. So first, we're going to start with you know, why transition to mobile BI, uh, covering the reasons uh, to make that transition. Uh, we'll also talk about some of the common reasons why organizations haven't yet transitioned, and then uh, some, some pointers on how to get over those hurdles. Uh, and then Ryan will lead us through some of the common challenges uh, face during a mobile BI implementation and some of the lessons learned that we've compiled over years of delivering mobile BI solutions. So first, the topic I want to address is the question, why transition to mobile BI? Uh, to help answer that, we've laid out a few stats here from various uh, you know, analysts and, and leaders in the space, um, but it's, it's really important first to understand where are we in this overall cycle. And as you can see, the trend is really moving towards the mobile delivery of everything, and business intelligence and analytics are really no different. Uh, more and more people uh, with either their company-issued devices or their personally owned devices uh, are using them. And so in spite of uh, whether you and your organization decide to uh, you know, enable those users via mobile uh, by, by delivering killer apps to them, uh, they're still going to find ways to incorporate their phones and tablets uh, into their day job. And so, you know, based on these stats, uh, I wanted to take a quick poll uh, of the audience here and kind of gauge where everyone is with their individual uh, organization mobile BI initiatives. So let's do a polling question. So the first question is, how pervasive is your organization's use of mobile business intelligence solutions? So on your screen, you should be able to see um, you should be able to see the polling question and actually you can click uh, in the screen to select which one of those most accurately represents kind of your, your uh, current state. So if you're not currently using it and you don't have any budgeted initiatives, uh, do you have a budgeted initiative but haven't yet actually deployed it? Uh, is it deployed but in limited usage, so maybe uh, one or two different departments are using mobile BI? Moderate usage, so several more. Uh, and then the last option is wide usage, so de uh, deployed across your entire enterprise. And we'll kind of wait as answers are trickling in. Kind of what I expected, what I'm seeing here, but we'll share in just a second. Okay. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and show you what we're looking at here. So this is what we found. So it looked like uh, the majority of folks haven't yet uh, started their initiative. Either there isn't a budgeted initiative uh, or it has been budgeted but not yet deployed. And uh, several of you have, have limited deployment, which makes sense given the topic of this. You guys are looking to understand what are the challenges and, and how can you actually get this uh, off the ground. So, why should we transition to mobile BI, if you haven't already? Well, I think the, the, we'll kind of take this in, in multiple chunks. We'll first look at the left-hand side and, and dis discuss increased user engagement and increased collaboration. You know, if you think about it, allowing users to use these devices, which everybody seems to really enjoy. I mean, it's hard enough to, to get me off of my mobile device, much less my kids or anybody else that I work with. So, uh, really allowing them to use the devices that they want to use uh, will allow them to further engage and be more responsive uh, to what they're doing on a daily basis. And so, you know, if they're more engaged, they're more likely to uh, view the information, and especially if they have their device with them all the time, you know, they'll, they'll really be uh, more apt to look at it on a regular basis. And the more apt they are to look at it, uh, the more likely they are to uh, act based on that information. And if it's something that they aren't uh, really uh, 
supposed to act on, but they need to communicate to somebody else to act on, it really allows for an increase in collaboration uh, by sharing uh, information. To give you an example, in a uh, field operations organization, say a retailer has its you know, above store management, and you've got regional managers and divisional managers, uh, by deploying mobile BI and, and the insights that are there, you can really allow users to see how things went yesterday, even before they get out of bed. And so, you know, they, they can look at that information, and through a lot of the mobile BI platforms, they can forward, you know, that concerning uh, event or insight or metric, they can forward that to the right person uh, first thing in the morning, which allows the action to really uh, begin right then. On the right-hand side, you know, simplified intuitive analytics and faster, better decisions. You know, by delivering the information in an intuitive way uh, on a mobile device, which is a device that they like to interact with, it really simplifies the process for making decisions. So not only can decisions uh, be made faster, but they also have a higher likelihood of success uh, because the decisions are being made on facts, which is always better than gut. Uh, you know, the facts are presented through dashboards or through alerts. Uh, and then those actions, because it's delivered wherever the, the user might be, the actions are being taken on a more timely basis. So, you know, more, uh, more likelihood of success and timeliness. So all of those benefits on the left hand and the right hand side, they really combine to ultimately drive the one that's in the center here, and that's increased productivity. Uh, you know, people are engaged and motivated to work together, uh, and mobile BI can sort of be the glue to make that easier to do. So putting insights into your employees' hands will allow them to accelerate uh, the business process that they are part of, uh, which ultimately will make them feel more empowered and will allow them to deliver a higher value for your organization. So another trend uh, in BI today is really moving from the rearview mirror uh, diagnostic analytics world, you know, where you might answer questions, what happened? Uh, and things are moving towards the predictive and to the prescriptive. So either answering what will happen or uh, how can we make it happen? And so predictive and prescriptive analytics really allow the user to see the various options that are in front of them and help them choose the one that would have uh, the best expected outcome. So, you know, coupling advanced analytics with the mobile delivery of those insights gets us closer to the holy grail or that killer app, so to speak, of really being able to make the best decisions at the best time. And, and if you're able to uh, enable your users to do that, uh, you're really positioning them to drive competitive advantage within the marketplace. So, you know, as, a, as an example, let's say uh, you're a restaurant manager and uh, you may or may not have looked at the weather this morning, but let's, let's say you didn't, uh, but the weather is actually going to turn pretty sour later on today. You know, predictive analytics and the modeling that could be built around that might suggest that you know, the labor uh, that we would need at the restaurant should be decreased because we expect customer traffic uh, to drop off when the weather gets worse. You know, so as guest counts go down, you obviously need less uh, people in the restaurant to be able to support uh, those guests. So if I, as a restaurant manager, were to receive an alert on my mobile device, uh, then I don't have to be in the back office in front of my computer in order to, one, get that insight delivered to me, but then, two, be able to take the recommended action of potentially uh, having some of the staff leave a little bit earlier today. So that's just an example of how combining predictive and prescriptive analytics uh, in a mobile environment will actually uh, deliver really making the best decisions at the best time, and, and that drives uh, efficiency, it drives you know, profit increasing, it also drives cost reduction. So you know, based on our earlier poll, it was, it was clear that not everybody has, has widely or broadly uh, deployed mobile BI across their enterprise. And so uh, what I want to talk through here are a few different uh, major reasons that we've seen in why organizations haven't yet uh, made it there. And so first, you know, we're not ready to tackle mobile yet. So you know, there's definitely a need uh, to prepare your organization uh, from a technology standpoint uh, to be able to deliver mobile BI. You know, the software that you use really needs to offer these mobile capabilities and you know, not all enterprise BI solutions are created equally uh, in terms of their support for mobile uh, BI. Uh, but beyond the software, you know, there's, there's obvious 
remote access and security considerations that have to be considered. And so uh, I don't want to understate the, uh, the importance of that, especially given all of the data breaches that we continue to hear about on a week-in, week-out basis. Secondly, we have no mobile standards in too many devices. You know, we find that companies haven't tackled some of the challenges that BYOD, a bring your own device, uh, presents. And, and really, there's mobile device proliferation. There are so many different handsets that are available. Uh, you know, it's really hard to get your arms around supporting all of those. And so you know, that, that's another thing that the enterprise will need to uh, get over. And we'll talk about some ways to get over that hurdle in a second. But uh, that is a major stumbling block that we've seen. And then finally, you know, like any technology initiative, there needs to be a champion. You know, there, there is, it can be hard to enlist the necessary support to get the initiative off of the ground, but then also to carry it through uh, to fruition. You know, and that, that includes, you know, the, the building of a business case. You know, can you actually convince uh, the executives at your company that it makes good financial sense uh, to invest in a mobile BI initiative? So let's take another quick poll uh, of the audience here, and let me pull it up on the screen. Second question we want to ask is, what do you think will be, or if you have actually gotten to that point in the life cycle, uh, what was the biggest challenge in your organization with incorporating mobile into your BI strategy? So were there no mobile device standards and that caused you uh, the challenges? Was it you know, insufficient systems, the BI systems, or otherwise uh, insufficient business processes or the people that would be there to actually uh, develop and support those solutions? Or was it really an executive sponsorship and uh, support issue that prevented your initiative from getting off the ground? Wait just a few more moments. All right, so let's close the poll, and I will share. So what we see here is it's either the, the proliferation of mobile devices uh, or insufficient people processes uh, or the, uh, the technology itself. But it's good to know that uh, it hasn't been, at least for this audience, uh, difficulty in securing the executive support. Um, so let me let me kind of help describe some of the things that we've seen uh, that that will help you get over those hurdles. You know, as we saw, there's several different reasons, uh, but I think the the recommendations we make here will help uh, each of you, depending on where you are in that process, uh, get past those challenges. So first. Like I said, it's really important to, to identify who's going to carry the torch. You know, oftentimes it's someone in operations because they may have uh, the most remote users, um, but really it needs to be somebody that has a strong and respected voice, not only uh, amongst the executive leadership, but also uh, the employee population in general, since this is and can be really a, an enterprise-wide capability. Next, uh, with that executive champion, you use them as the change agent to help drive clarification of your organization's BYOD policy. Uh, you know, the discussion on BYOD will likely involve IT from a technology standpoint, HR, because invariably there's going to be some rules that are put in place uh, that people may or may not follow, and that can create some HR challenges. Uh, so they definitely need to be in the loop. And then, obviously, legal. You know, typically the way we see this is a BYOD policy is an extension or a refinement of your company's existing acceptable use policy. And so the balance we're trying to strike here, uh, which isn't easy necessarily, but you know, the goal is to establish a policy that, that you know, protects both the individual users uh, as well as the company, uh, but doesn't create too much bureaucracy or uh, create this fear of you know, big brothers watching. And so uh, by, by having that executive champion drive that clarification and engaging the lines of business as well, 
you know, if you keep those goals in mind of, of you know, protecting the business, protecting the individuals, uh, and not creating too much red tape, uh, you'll be able to navigate through that. The third hurdle, uh, or I guess recommendation to overcoming hurdles, is, you know, on the topic of device proliferation. So, you know, we've seen companies beginning to reduce the number of available options that are given to employees if they're delivering a company-issued device. You know, that basically allows for a standard to evolve over time uh, without the company incurring significant cost to replace a bunch of those device and, uh, devices prior to them reaching uh, end of life. You know, I think uh, people will also begin to kind of self-standardize on the devices that are supported for uh, the mobile BI initiatives or frankly any mobile initiative because they'll see that the capabilities that are being offered are only offered on certain devices and so they will typically select those devices that allow them to, to get the capabilities that the company is offering through applications. I'm going to take uh, number four and five kind of together here but you know with any new technology initiative it's important to set yourself up for an initial success and so you know, it really makes sense to engage third-party software uh, and services providers to help you tightly scope that initial project that you are putting up for approval. Uh, you know, by using third parties that have been there and done that, uh, it can definitely uh, be a smaller, faster, and more successful project by using their collective experience. Uh, one thing I'll note, you know, we've seen some clients whose enterprise BI solution may not enable you know, the, the, the mobile BI capabilities that they want. We have seen clients bring in a best of breed product uh, to handle just the mobile uh, side of things and, and those two platforms coexist leveraging the same, you know, underlying data warehouse or data marts. And so that's just another option to consider. And then finally, you know, again, leverage the resources you have available to you and the third party software and services providers you know, they have a vested interest in, in your project getting approved, and so lean on them for the expertise that they bring when it comes to quantifying the uh, business value of the initiative that you're trying to get off the ground. So if you follow those you know, recommendations for overcoming the challenges, uh, or the hurdles, uh, rather, that are standing in the way of your mobile BI initiative, uh, hopefully you've gotten the green light at this point. And so, uh, I want to hand it over to Ryan Campanile, who's going to take you through the implementation side uh, of your mobile BI initiative. Thanks, Matt. Appreciate it. Um, so Matt and I have been involved in uh, quite a few mobile BI implementations over the last couple of years. And uh, just like any project, uh, we've uh, you know, experienced uh, challenges with, all, with, each, with each project and implementation. But part of what we want to share with you today are some of the common challenges that we've seen after doing these mobile VI implementations, as well as some of the corresponding lessons learned that go along with those challenges. So some of the common challenges we see are um, what you see here. Uh, first of all, there's this, um, sometimes there's a mindset of, of just copying over something that exists current state, some old reports or traditional reports that exist, to a mobile application or um, you know, not fully focusing on uh, or putting enough rigor around the mobile user experience. Uh, two other ones that we see are really uh, especially relevant for, for this audience where, as we saw from the poll, that there, that there may be a first time uh, mobile BI implementation. So these two tend to be relevant to that um, where, where we're not starting with the, first, the, the right best fit for the first use case where we deploy mobile. Uh, and we'll get into that one a little more later and sh to share some examples. But also, uh, along with that as well, is not enough. There, there not being enough time in the project plan for to address the the mobile infrastructure deployment, some of the security issues, and other things uh, that go along with the mobile implementation. Uh, and lastly, of course, uh, Matt hit on this a little bit too about not having enough support uh, from the business or users and really that the impact on you know adoption ultimately which is what we're you know shooting for when we do deploy that so with with that let's uh let's jump in now to the lessons learned and as i said we have five we'll share here so i'll start with the first one which is uh don't really don't cop, don't have this mindset of copying old reports or the current state reports that you have uh you know spend time or make sure that there's time allocated to understand the functional aspects of what you're implementing 
And uh, really, when we say that, we're really talking about it, that especially in a case where, where um, the, the first time you are deploying mobile, you are taking something that exists and then enabling that on a mobile device, what happens is uh, the team has the tendency to, um, you know, sort of not put a, a lot of focus on the functional requirements or the functional side of it because the mindset is that this is just a re-implementation of an old set of requirements, right? Uh, the problem with that is that uh, we, we see a lot of challenges uh, we've seen that end up coming back later to uh, really that uh, ultimately end up, you know, causing big issues for the project and for the users that are trying to adopt it. So uh, here's a couple of things to consider uh, as you're thinking through this, uh, why, you know, this is especially relevant here, even if you are just copying this over. Is that, you know, one of the questions that, that gets asked is, um, you know, for all these KPIs that currently exist, let's say on the current report, you know, are they all still currently being used and necessary now? Uh, are there some that are unrelated yet grouped on those reports right now? And what about, you know, um, the, which ones are more important than others, right? We have a tendency on, on traditional reports to, let's say, just have a group of six metrics where, in reality, there might be one metric that's really the primary one. And depending on the value of that KPI metric, I may then look at the other five. So, so it's very important to identify these things and not just take a mindset if I have this current report right now, it's got 30 metrics on it, and my, my requirement is I'm just going to translate those 30 metrics to a mobile delivery. Uh, you know, one, um, one quick thing I'll share is that Matt and I have been in several uh, requirements workshops where we're working on a mobile BI implementation where we're in this exact scenario where someone's taking sort of a current state report and we're, we're using that as the basis for some of the, the requirements going into the, the mobile BI implementation. And we'll be in the workshop and we'll get to a certain set of KPIs on those reports. And, uh, and we'll ask, you know, what they're used for or, you know, what actions are being taken with these. And, and really we'll go around the room and of all the stakeholders in the room, uh, no one can seem to remember why that metric's even on the report and what it's being used for. So just an example there as to why it's, um, you, you still have to, you know, think about the, that side of it and make sure you put focus on the functional side, uh, even if you are just, uh, you know, copying over a current state report. Uh, another one, and uh, Matt mentioned uh, um, something about this earlier, is that you also, have, you know, we talked about one of the biggest values that Mobile BI will bring what it is the transformational nature of, you know, changing the current state business process. So, so is there, um, those are the things that you have to consider also when you're implementing this, is that is, are there, um, for example, is there a transactional capability that you can add that would, you know, streamline the process related to these metrics, right? So the, the current state may be that there's a metric on a report and, and, uh, and there's some action taken that, uh, that the user has to go to some other system to, um, to implement that action versus if, um, you know, from this uh, mobile BI application, if we can implement that transaction as part of the app, would that not streamline that process? Or another example is could you take certain groups of metrics and then put them in a standalone function that is, that is just centered on that business process. But uh, the key point here that we're trying to convey is that, um, is that we've, we've, seen it, we've, we've seen it like a recurring theme over and over of people, when, especially on the first time deployments, as we said, they, they tend to when I gloss over those uh, functional aspects because of the, of the mindset of, you know, we've already hashed through these, these functional requirements, that's what the current reports are. But uh, because of all these examples and, and more, uh, it, it's definitely, you need to make sure that you're, you know, just like any project, you're putting the proper focus on the functional side and the aspects of, of your mobile BI uh, implementation. Uh, the next uh, lesson learned that we'll go through is that uh, you really have to focus heavily on the mobile user experience. So this is something that, you know, one of the problems we've seen, or I guess not a problem, it's more of a, of a challenge with, with mobile applications is that, you know, and Matt touched on a stat about this earlier, is that your users are already using their mobile devices, right? Everyone's already using them for personal use. A lot of people are using them for, for work-related uses, even not sanctioned by the organization. So, so what's happened is there's already an expectation, there's already a bar set there. And, and users have no tolerance for a poor user experience on a mobile device, right? Uh, even, even myself, I find myself when I'm using an enterprise application, you know, I expect it to act just like the other apps I use from a consumer standpoint. 
I expect it to be very intuitive. I expect it to be lightning fast, right? Even a small delay, and I'm, and I'm, I'm not using the app anymore. So uh, unlike traditional BI applications where, um, uh, so let's take performance, for instance, uh, where the traditional approach might be, you know, you go through a typical life cycle, you gather the requirements, you go through the technical side and implementation, and then there's a QA portion where maybe you do some performance tuning and performance testing. And, and a lot of times the approach is, you know, we need to get it as, uh, speed it up and make it as fast as possible. But with, with mobile, it, it's actually, you know, performance needs to be the first, one of the first things and the highest priority right up front. Even, even taking precedence over some of the functional requirements. In other words, in other words, it's not good enough to say, here's the functional requirements for my mobile app, and then I'm going to try to make it as, uh, perform as fast as I can. That's not good enough. It has to be lightning fast. And if you have to give up some functional tie or some functional requirements to make it fast, that's what you have to do because otherwise you risk that the, the adoption won't be there. Users won't use it. Um, uh, you know, less is more. And this is one of the things I'll, I'll keep talking about throughout this entire thing is that, you know, uh, to, especially on, the, the, on, on a small form factor, you have to you have to make sure it's very, very simple, and you have to really, really focus exactly what you're doing. Uh, as we talked about with the metrics, you know, what are the only the most important and the, and the primary things that need to be here? And you need to make it very simple and intuitive, but also make it very exceptional for what it is. Uh, lastly, the last thing I'll mention here about the mobile user experience is, you know, uh, leveraging the capabilities of um, a BI platform. Uh, you know, one of the problems that we've uh, already talked about is you know, device proliferation. There's, there's a lot of different form factors. There's a lot of different device types. So how will you be able to manage that, right? Well, um, you know, by leveraging a BI or, or mobile application platform, you can help uh, mitigate some of the issues with that. Uh, Matt and I both have done several projects with the MicroStrategy uh, mobile BI platform, and we've had uh, some good success there because they um, have an approach of, you know, being able to develop once and deploy to multiple device types. So um, what I'd like to do is hit on a couple of other um, topics related to uh, the mobile user experience, specifically related to uh, the, the, the UX design. Um, and I have some examples here, too, from some of the um, projects that we've worked on. So one of them is, uh, you know, you have to consider the limited real estate of, of the devices that you're working with, right? And uh, as I said, you know, again, the less is more sort of mentality there. And, um, one of the things is, uh, again, especially if you're migrating over a traditional set of reports, one of the, you have to avoid this temptation of that, uh, well, this is what they had before. They had 60 metrics, so I'm going to try to put all 60 of these metrics uh, on this, uh, you know, iPhone screen. Um, you know, there's this approach out there that you guys have probably heard of in application development called mobile first, where, where what you do is in application development, as opposed to starting with web or desktop, you know, you start with uh, a mobile device. And one of the benefits of doing something like that is, uh, let's say you start with a smartphone form factor, is that you really, you really force yourself into really, really honing into what is most important, right? Uh, there's this uh, thing in sort of uh, this, I guess, joke around, you know, when you're gathering functional requirements and you present these options to the, the users and say which one of these are, you know, most important to you. And the answer is they're all important. And, uh, but, you know, that's uh, by, by going in and, and dealing with such a small form factor like a smartphone, you're really having to force yourself to say, well, what is the most important thing here? That's, what, that's what's important to us. Everything else can be secondary or part of um, some sub-navigation or, um, you know, or later down in the workflow. Which brings me to the, the, next, uh, the next point that we wanted to mention is, is really creating this um, intuitive analytical workflow. Uh, Matt, can you go to the next slide? Yeah, thanks. Um, so, so this is something that we, we talk about over and over again, creating this, uh, this analytical workflow. And, and one of the examples I wanted to show here, I don't know if uh, the screenshot is sort of small, but on the right-hand side there, you'll see that um, we have an iPad screen with basically three panels on it. And what this represents is we had a, a client who, in current state, they had some income statements or some financial statements, right, that they were sending out via PDF. And, and some of these users were getting a PDF that was 300 uh, pages long. And basically because it was, it was these uh, income statements for different levels of the organization, different roll-ups, right, and different levels of account detail. And what we were able to do is we were able to take that information, and this one iPad screen you see here on the right is that 
the, the left-hand panel you can see basically are the income statement and the P&L line items. And any one, uh, of course, you could filter this by different roll-ups and business units and time periods, but you could also tap on any one of those uh, income statement items and see on the right-hand side it would then update all the account detail for that item. And then additionally, you could click on one of those detail items and it would pop up a window of all the actual transactions that went against that account detail. And so really what we did is we were able to show that in, in one screen there and in a couple of taps or interactions with the screen, the user can get everything they were getting before, actually and more, because that 300-page document I mentioned, it actually didn't even have the transaction detail. So, uh, and it also didn't have, you can see at the bottom too, is that when you click on any of those items, it also gives you a, a rolling six-month trend for, um, for that particular uh, KPI or, or metric that you're looking at. So, uh, this is what we mean by this intuitive analytical workflow, allowing the user to, with a small amount of space, be able to really uh, drill further in and get to, you know, dig in to get to the level of detail they need, while at the same time not trying to represent all of that in, in one big grid on the screen, so to speak. Uh, the last uh, point that I'll uh, mention is, uh, is basically, uh, and this is something that we've seen problems with where you have, you may have a, a development team and, and they're used to developing for, for web, right? And so they're used to developing for uh, controls, interactions, the size of elements on the screen. They're, they're used to developing those things for interactions with the mouse and for you know, screens that have you know, high resolutions, right? Versus, uh, you know, you have, to, you have to be careful that on, on mobile devices that you're making sure that the, the, the items are sized appropriately, both for, for viewing and for interacting. And, uh, and as you all know uh, from using your mobile devices, there's, there's a, a standard set of gestures that you may not even be aware of, but you're very used to how you, you use those gestures and applications, and there's, there's very much, um, even you know, before users ever use your application, there's already these de facto standards in place because of all the other applications out there and devices and how you interact with them. So you have to be sure that your design considers those things and you don't go against that because uh, even if you train a user, it, it, it would be counterintuitive to them to do something different than they've been doing for the last five years with every other mobile application they've been interacting with, right? So, you have to make sure and consider that those aspects in the, the mobile user experience as well. So, um, so moving on, one of the other uh, lessons learned that we wanted to discuss and, uh, uh, is that basically what we found is that we've seen the most success in these mobile BI deployments where that we start very small initially and then and then build momentum through that success, right? So, um, so one of the things we mean by that is is first of all, and we mentioned this earlier about starting with the right use case or process. And, and, and what, one of the things that we focus on there is something that is well established right now. And because what happens is what we've seen is that it's muddying the waters to try to, to try to implement something that's, let's say, not well established or known to them and try to now deliver that over multiple devices and form factors. So, I mean, as an example, let's say your company is implementing a new performance evaluation process with a new set of KPIs for how people are evaluated and how their bonuses are paid. Well, that might not also be the same time to roll that out uh, with mobile consumption, right? Uh, because if they're trying to understand that and we're muddying the waters with a new way for them to consume and, and take action on that information, then uh, we're, we're creating a job that's uh, you know, doubly more difficult in terms of making it successful. Uh, another one that we see is uh, is, is that by starting small, we're saying, you know, try to limit the form factors and device types that you're going to be deploying to. Uh, a common sort of debate or, or discussion we'll have with our clients is, on, on one hand, they want to deploy to, to iPads or, or tablets because that's what the executives will see and the champions, and they, they want them to be able to consume it on that. But the field managers, let's say, uh, they're going to be using uh, smartphones. So they want to go there. So they tend to want to do everything to meet both sides needs or our different user types needs. But what we found is it's best to avoid that temptation, focus in on one uh, that is the best fit uh, for the users that you're going to be deploying to and, and, uh, and really, you know, expand it from there. Because otherwise you're going to end up with a wasted effort, right? Because you're not going to hit the bullseye the first time. I mean, 
uh, there will be a wasted effort if you try to, the very first time you're rolling this out, deploy it to all the different uh, form factors and device types that are in your audience. Uh, lastly, uh, you know, start with the pilot and phase roll out over time. Uh, again, we've seen uh, success on this front where, uh, and, and this is, um, well, what we see is that normally what, uh, and this is just an example, but uh, if you roll out, for instance, to just some members of the core team, even at the corporate office, let's say, you know, five to ten users, and then uh, slowly trickle out and expand, have an expanded rollout from there, uh, that is, uh, we, we've seen the, the most success with that in terms of you're, you're able to, one, work out any kinks in the QA process and, uh, and also get valuable feedback from some of the users that actually you will rely on to champion uh, the, the app later. So it helps from that standpoint. But it also helps from the standpoint, as, as we said, if this is one of the first times uh, that you're rolling out, that just as equally are all the other things that they're not used to before. So, for instance, you don't, if you don't have an MDM solution in place or or the user isn't familiar yet with how to how to um, you know uh, get deploy an application to their device uh, from the the MDM application. There's a lot of hiccups in that process too that aren't even really related to the specific uh, mobile BI application that that you'll be able to work out because regardless of whether it's in the application or part of the MDM, the, the entire thing encompasses the user experience, and you don't you want you want that to be as smooth as possible by the time you're doing a large-scale rollout. Um, that really brings me into the, the, the next lesson learned, which is make sure you get the under, underlying deployment, the security, the infrastructure, get those things worked out beforehand for the project. I mean, as we mentioned, uh, one of the things that Matt and I have seen is, and we've had this challenge on quite a few of our projects where you know, when it's the first time deployment is that the amount of time it takes us to actually develop a mobile app application is a lot less than it takes to get these other things worked out. And so if there's not enough time in the project plan and there's not enough contingency in there for all the issues and challenges that we'll face, we end up with timeline delays of the project related to it. So, uh, you know, from the mobile device management solution and how you'll be able to deploy the app to the, the BYOD policy that Matt mentioned earlier, I mean, one of the things there is that uh, both these things are, tend to be sort of cross-departmental, so to speak. So uh, the BYOD policy is going to end up having uh, have legal involved, HR, and other departments involved, right, as opposed to, let's say, just the, the, the BI group that's implementing the application. So those things are things that have to be uh, thought out and planned for well ahead of time. Or, uh, and, you, and you have to make sure you're leaving enough, um, let's say, contingency or, or room in there so that you're not going to cause uh, you know, a timeline risk to your project. Same thing with the uh, mobile security and mobile infrastructure. Again, assuming if this is if this is the first time deployment, those are the types of things that you may or may not have that expertise in house. So there are delays and challenges in getting all that set up and being ready to go. Um, lastly, um, the one of the last the lessons learned that we want to uh, share is, is we say you know adoption is not a one-time event. You have to nurture it throughout the project, and this really goes along with. Um, it sort of goes along with what we had talked about with the first uh, lesson learned about the, the functional aspects. And that what happens is, is um, it's not that people don't understand the, the adoption process, change management, the communication, those things, but it's almost like sometimes it's, it's um, uh, less focus is put on it because of the same reasons I talked about before, right? The, the mindset is that, well, we're just giving them something that they're already familiar with, or all we're doing is giving them it on a mobile device, and that's that's so great and exciting. Who wouldn't want to use that, right? Who wouldn't uh, adopt that? But um, but for for the reasons we discussed earlier, you you have to. And really, I mean, this is sort of the culmination of some of the other lessons learned. Because if you are doing those things, then uh, then really that that in a way is addressing uh, the adoption. In other words, if you are putting that focus on the on the mobile user experience and you are getting the users involved very early up front, even in the design phase, and then and then an initial uh, pilot rollout. Uh, you know, those are the things you're doing on, let's say, that side to address the issues that, that could come with, uh, you know, uh, with adoption issues. Um, on the same side, uh, Matt discussed about the you know, champions of the, of the app. Uh, really, if, if you have those champions and you're engaging them early, that's going to um, help because they're going to help evangelize and sort of sponsor this and get people excited about it as you roll it out. So, um, so with that, 
those were sort of the five lessons learned, as I uh, mentioned, that, uh, that Matt and I really feel like we've built over the last couple of years and we've seen that are related to these common challenges that we've seen for these first-time mobile guide deployments. Uh, one of the things I'd like to do is uh, just go review with you real quick the key sort of takeaways that we wanted you to walk away from this with today. Uh, the first one is, uh, you know, don't over overlook the functional aspect and the transformational nature of mobile BI. Uh, you know, if you, if you do just um, take a mindset of copying over those, those current reports, you're, you're not going to get as much value for what you're delivering to the users. And worse, you risk possibly not hitting the mark. Uh, the second is, uh, you know, by starting small, you actually, we're going to decrease the time to value and um, avoid, as I said, that wasted investment or effort from not hitting the, that mark initially. Uh, the mobile user experience should be treated with much higher priority than previously. As, as we talked about, uh, the, the, the chances are that whatever, whatever uh, you know, you and your organization have done in the past in terms of user experience on, on the BI side of things, chances are, it's not, with a, you know, it needs to be a lot higher in terms of when you start to look at the mobile BI side of things. Um, uh, again, start early and allocate more time to establishing the infrastructure. As we mentioned, uh, that almost always takes a lot longer than, than the, the first use case that we implement. So you want to make sure you have enough contingency to that. And lastly, you know, engage with the users and make sure you have those champions that can help uh, start to evangelize that application. So. Um, so that's it, and um, and uh, those are the main points we wanted you to take away. And I think what we're going to do now is uh, we still have some time left over, and we're going to do a Q&A session. So I think, uh, Matt, I'll turn that back over to you if you want to take the questions. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. Um, in your uh, the webinar panel, there's a, an area for questions. Uh, we've had a few that have uh, come in, so while we're answering those, uh, feel free to pose additional questions. So the first question here, and I'm thinking, Ryan, why don't you take this one, but uh, related to your point about starting small, what is the typical time frame you've seen for a first mobile BI implementation? Uh, okay. Um, yeah, so what I would say is, well, I mean, uh, I think, unfortunately, I don't know if this is the, the right type of answer you're looking for, but of course, with any implementation, the answer to that, it depends. And, uh, and we've seen uh, it vary depending on some of the factors that we've talked about. For instance, how many device types and form factors are you rolling this out to? How many uh, sort of use cases and how many users are involved and, and those types of things. But just to give you a range, I would say on the, on the short end, we've been involved in some implementations that were probably, I mean, not, of course, excluding the infrastructure and the MDM and those things. I'm talking about just the, the, the BI application implementation. Uh, We've seen on uh, you know leveraging an enterprise BI platform and on in the order of let's say four weeks on the low end. So we've had some that we've uh, gotten out and deployed very quickly. Uh, on the higher end, I would say uh, thinking about just a, a first use case, maybe somewhere around uh, you know four, five, six months uh, is on the high end of uh, some of the first implementations we've rolled out. Yeah, and to, to add a little bit more there, Ryan, uh, you know, the, the longer ones have typically been uh, beyond just a single use case. You know, there's a there's a collection of, you know, in an agile environment, the, the stories that we want to be able to satisfy. And that may be for different user types. It may be for uh, different form factors. And it also can include, if you're doing something new, it could include the web delivery uh, of that BI capability as well. And so, you know, the longer time frames are, are typically a, a, as Ryan mentioned earlier, sort of a phased approach where we're deploying incremental capabilities over, you know, that, that four to six month time, uh, time frame. Okay, uh, the next question uh, we have here is, uh, our company doesn't have a mobile device management solution yet. Is that required? Uh, and what are some of the options out there? So uh, I'll take this one, Ryan. So, I guess while it isn't required, you know, depending on the scale of users that you plan to deploy to and the level of simplicity you want to enable for those users, uh, we do recommend uh, an MDM solution. You know, it really handles several aspects that can make a mobile deployment complex. So, whether that's securely accessing, uh, you know, your internal uh, servers to access the BI solution, and doing that over a secure tunnel, 
uh, MDM solutions can enable that VPN connectivity. Uh, you know, one of the big things about MDM is if the mobile device, whether it's a company issued device or a personally owned device, if that gets in the wrong hands, uh, whether maliciously or accidentally, you know, having the ability to remotely wipe uh, the sensitive company specific information off of that device is another key capability that, that MDM offers. Uh, beyond that, you know, apps will, will change and update just like they, they do if you purchase it on an app store. And so being able to, you know, have that device check in to see whether there is a new version of a particular app available uh, and then pushing those types of app updates down to the device, uh, that's another capability. Um, and then I guess the other side of it is it comes down to a question of how do you want to actually deploy these mobile BI apps to your users? Are you going to put it out on uh, the, say, Apple App Store and just password protect it so that anybody can download it but only you know, the employees who happen to have the username and password can actually get into it? Uh, a lot of the MDM solutions offer sort of an internal uh, enterprise app store where you can post whatever apps, whether they're BI or, or other mobile apps for the employees, you can also then secure that app store. So not all employees would have access to see every app to download. So uh, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a big uh, set of, of uh, I guess, capability that an MDM solution uh, would offer. So as far as uh, the second half of that question, which was what are some of the options out there? I mean, there's there are a bunch of them. You know, there's there's been a lot of consolidation in the market over the past couple of years. Uh, you know, AirWatch, IBM Mass 360, Mobile Iron, uh, Citrix Zen Mobile, Good Technology, Mobi Control. I mean, I could, the list goes on. Uh, you know, if you're in the the I guess in the the look for the hunt for an MDM solution, uh, I'd recommend you going online and, and searching for the Gartner Magic Quadrant. Uh, and, and they don't call it mobile device management anymore. They, they, Gartner has sort of broadened their definition, and they now call it enterprise mobility management, of which mobile device management uh, and access management and content management are the other components. But uh, you know, definitely uh, you know, do, your, do your research, and uh, the Gartner Magic Quadrant is a good place uh, to look for that. Uh, we have one more question here. And Ryan sort of addressed it earlier, but it, it doesn't hurt to ask it again. Uh, my users have both iPhones and iPads. Should I build uh, the same capabilities into both? Yeah, I would say um, I, I would say definitely in terms of uh, well, in terms of what capabilities to build and where to start. I mean, as, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, uh, especially, I mean, well, if you have a certain use case where, for instance, you know your audience, your target users are going to be using, for instance, iPad. Well, then, of course, uh, that's what you uh, develop for, the, the iPad. If, uh, on the other hand, as in this case, where you have, you have content that you're going to be, or an application that you're going to be developing, enabling over multiple form factors, like a tablet or and smartphone and the web, for instance, uh, uh, in terms of where to start, I like, um, as I said, that mobile-first mentality, uh, starting with the smallest form factor, because it, uh, as I said, in terms of the upfront side and the functional aspect of things, it really helps enable, you know, really thinking about what the primary importance here, uh, you know, and what should the flow be, because uh, the smallest form factor is going to be the most difficult to enable that in, right? Uh, or require the most thought of what that workflow should be, the, the most thought about what the priority of what we're trying to do. Um, and then in terms of the, the, the capabilities on the different form factors, that's a, uh, maybe a larger discussion, but, but generally speaking, I would say it, it is the, I mean, it, I mean, if it's the same application that you're, in use case that you're trying to implement on those devices, well, then it does need to be uh, consistent, right? Uh, that's what we talked about, simple, intuitive. Right, so it uh, it does need to be a very consistent experience, uh, but that doesn't mean it has to be exactly the same. Right, uh, sometimes let's say something you uh, implement on on the let's say a smartphone uh, has one interface, but then you go to let's say a tablet interface, and maybe you can provide additional content to that flow or things that you couldn't feasibly do on a smartphone. So. So generally speaking, yes, it needs to be a very simple and consistent, uh, you know, experience across both. But 
uh, but there, there, there would be slight differences that you enable, let's say, for the tablet or the web versus uh, on a smartphone device. Yeah, I think the, the other thing I'll add uh, to that is you, know, you, you need to put yourself in, in the shoes of the user. You know, if, if these you know, first level of metrics that, that you plan to uh, show somebody on a mobile device, you know, are they going to be more likely to have their phone on their nightstand or are they going to have their iPad on the nightstand? And you, know, you can really drive uh, differences in, in what you might put on the phone version versus an iPad version based on when and how they actually will be using it. Uh, and so you, know, you may not have the ability to go into all of the same detail on the phone that you have on the iPad uh, because that isn't really necessarily how they're going to want to use uh, the phone. It really may just be, I need to be able to, to look at a, a snapshot of, of how are things performing today or how did they go uh, you know, yesterday after all the, the, the polling was done for our, our stores. Uh, so again, that, that can be another nuance that, that would help you decide whether to put the same content just formatted differently uh, on two different uh, device form factors. Okay, well I appreciate uh, everybody's attendance and thank you for asking the questions. Uh, if anybody uh, would like to reach out to us about any other questions that you have um, offline, uh, you can see our contact information here on the webinar. And uh, after this, we will also make the webinar available on our website uh, if you want to point any of your colleagues uh, to, uh, to the content afterwards. So again, thanks for your attendance, and uh, we'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.